All right, take two. Howdy doody there. I'm going to find a place to put this. So, this is a series of videos I've been wanting to make for a long time. This is on maybe the most interesting part of math that I can think of. I've seen some math, you know. Um, but this stuff, it's just blow your mind good, okay. Um, the book that I'm using here is Tom Apostle's Modular Functions and Dirichlet Series in Number Theory. It's, it's graduate, you know, is that the yellow and white smart mother effer books. Uh, but this is very easily, you know, easily digestible. All you need is a little bit of complex analysis, um, you know, and maybe some, some group theory or whatever. You can pick that stuff up in pieces as you go too, though. Um, and, and some of the things about this theory are just so gorgeous, and it's attracted maybe the brightest mathematicians um, in history. I think everybody's kind of touched on this a little bit, from back in the day with Euler all the way up to, uh, you know, um, Andrew Wiles and Fermat's Last Theorem. You know, it's just an incredibly beautiful theory. So what I'm going to start with is elliptic functions. Now, elliptic functions, they got their name... Uh, because of this problem back in the 1700s of finding the arc length of an ellipse, okay? You remember uh, in calculus, you have this formula where you take uh, the derivative squared plus 1 under the square root, and then you integrate that, and you get this formula for arc length. And that's just because, you know, this would be your dx here, and this would be your dy, and this you're just making a little triangle. It's going to be the square root of dx squared plus dy squared, right? Well, if you try to do this for a circle, you get a, a nice, neat formula. If you try to do it for a lot of other curves, you get a nice, neat formula. But if you try to do this for an ellipse, you're not going to get anything very nice. In fact, if you, if you, if you do actually try this, you know, you can do it using polar coordinates, or you could do it... Uh, any number of ways, you wind up with an integral that actually is so difficult it has its own name. It's called an elliptic integral. Elliptic integral of the second kind. Okay? You see, I'm using elliptic. That's the reason I'm talking about this. It has to do something with elliptic functions. So anyway... Uh, you get this elliptic integral of the second kind. There's no ni ne nice, neat, uh, closed form of this thing. You can't, you know, easily calculate it. Um, and if you plug it into Wolfram Alpha, you might get something in terms of hyper geometric series or, or some crazy nonsense that God only knows what it is, you know, something that looks really complicated. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is because this puzzled people. Right? But people wanted to know why can't why can't we find this integral? You know, what's the deal with this? Or like let's study this. What's going on here? Well, in the eighteen hundreds, Abel, who some of you might know of from Abelian groups or, or maybe any number of other things that, that guy's done, Abel was investigating the inverse of these elliptic integrals of the second kind. And yes, there is a first and a third kind. Um, he was looking at the inverse. He called it the amplitude. So he's looking at finding the parameter given the answer, right? And he found that this, this inverse, inverse of this integral, of elliptic integral, I can't write very smoothly, so I'm just going to integral, is doubly periodic. So he's, he found that it was doubly periodic, right? At the same time, another guy named Weierstrass and, and, uh, and even before him, Eisenstein, were looking at infinite series um, that they, they were able to create infinite products of and, and kind of mimic and actually define tr um, trigonometric functions. So all of this kind of comes together. And, um, and this part right here, this doubly periodic, this is one of the key things about elliptic functions. So the reason I'm mentioning all this is just to give you an idea of why these people were looking into this in the first place. Um, these elliptic integrals wind up being, their inverses are elliptic functions, right? And the elliptic functions are more general than the elliptic integrals. So that's the last time I'll probably mention them. Uh, but we do have here, this is doubly periodic, okay? And we have it, it's meromorphic, okay? And that's it. 
that's that's it. All right, see you later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, these these are beautiful. You're gonna love these things. Just hang on. I sound like Trump. So these are doubly periodic and they're meromorphic. What does that mean? That means that all the singularities here, all the singularities are poles, right? You can't you you cannot write well with these stupid tablets, by the way. I don't know how people do it. It takes me forever to write well. It's so ugly. But what are you going to do? All right. So all of the singularities are poles. So ding, ding, we're talking about complex functions here, right? We're talking about functions that are going from C to C. And when I say doubly periodic, here's what I mean, okay? There are two periods, okay? There's omega-1, and omega-2, and again, I'm using apostle here. I'll talk about that in a second. This is true, okay? These are your two periods, omega-1 and omega-2, and the definition of the doubly periodic function is that you can add any integer linear combination of these two periods, and you get the same thing, okay? Now, there's one, there's one thing we want to make sure of, though. And that's that we want to make sure that when we divide these two periods, okay, we don't get a real number. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we don't want a real number here? Well, no real. Because if it is a real number, and maybe I'll just go over here and get a little scratch. The whole thing is scratch paper, but whatever. Let's say that I, that I have a ratio that's real, okay? What does that mean? Well, that means that I got, you know, this is, uh, let's say this is omega-1, then omega-2 is going to be collinear, right? And this is, you know, this is in the complex plane or whatever. This is hideous, but you see what I'm saying, right? Here's your real, here's your imaginary. They're collinear. That's not interesting. That's, well, maybe it is interesting, but it's going to be like one-dimensional, right? You're going to have a uh, a weird period. And actually, you could, I think there's a way to prove that, well, whatever. We're not going to talk about that. So, we're focused on things where the ratio is... Oh, my God. We're focused on things where the ratio is complex, okay? And if the ratio is complex, then you have this neat little parallelogram, just like you would in vector calculus, right? Here's your real... Here's your imaginary, okay, and you have this nice parallelogram. Now, the reason I, you know, spastically said, I'm using apostle, by the way, is because some other authors, okay, they will call these omega and omega-2 will be half periods, okay? Apostle uses omega and omega-2 to be the full periods. So that's the reason I, I said that so erratically. He's one of the few people who calls omega-1 and omega-2 the full period. So we have this parallelogram just like we would in vector calculus. And because this is doubly periodic, this little point right here, I kind of pointed to this point, is going to be the same once we plug it into f as this point plugged into f, right? Because what am I doing? If this is z, then this is z plus omega-1, right? Man, I am really bad at writing these things, okay? And similarly, if this is z, let's call it z, z prime, then this is z prime plus omega-2. That's going to be the same thing after I plug it into the function, right? So really all I'm caring about is what goes on in this parallelogram because everything else in the whole complex plane is just going to be a repeat of what's happening in this parallelogram. You see what I'm saying? So this is, um, I think they call it the fundamental parallelogram. And this is going to be what we really care about. This is every single value this function is going to take is going to be right here on this little section right here. Okay. Now, let's think about this for a second. What do we know? Let's say that F is, is elliptic. Okay. Okay, let's say that F is elliptic. The first thing that you need to know, okay, is that if f is elliptic, 1 over f, let me just put a bullet point, 1 over f, minus f, uh, and actually let's add another g, uh, f times g, f plus g, um, f over g, 
uh, f prime, all this crap is also elliptic. Okay? It's all elliptic. So you get one elliptic function, you get a whole bunch of elliptic functions. Now, what does that mean? Okay? What if f, what if f um, doesn't have any poles? Say, if f has no poles, what does that mean? That means f is constant. Because it's bounded on this. It's an entire function except for poles, right? That's meromorphic, entire except for poles. So if it's bounded on this parallelogram, then it's bounded on the whole complex plane. Bada bing, bada boom. It's constant. That's Louisville's theorem. If f has no zeros, then what? Then 1 over f has no poles. So f is constant. Okay, so what do we know? This thing, if f, so f is either constant, f could be constant, or it has poles. Has poles and zeros. Right? F is constant, or it has both poles and zeros. What else can we say about this? Well, let's think about this for a second. What's the integral around the parallelogram? Well, the integral around this parallelogram, and this is going to look so ugly, and I'm so sorry ahead of time, but I'm just going to do it. The integral around this parallelogram has to be the, inner, the, the same as the integral around this parallelogram, right? And if we're going in a counterclockwise way here, and we're going counterclockwise here, look at this. Now, I'm going in the opposite direction here, which means that this integral of this side is the opposite of this integral of this side. So they cancel. I could do the same thing up top here. These two cancel. The integral is zero. What does that mean? That means that the sum of the residues of f, this is from the Cauchy, Cauchy residue theorem. This means the sum of the residues of f is zero. I should probably put this up here too. This is from, this is from I'm going to misspell this, or just add, if you don't know how to spell it, just add another letter, right? I know I misspelled that, Louisville's theorem. Whatever, you don't have to, I don't think there's an S there, whatever, okay. So what does that mean? Let's think about that for a second. Let's say there, let's say, okay, first of all, it could be constant, again, or it could, or it could be non-constant, and it could have poles, but if it does have poles, then the poles either have to be at at minimum, I'll just say at minimum. You're either going to have one pole of order greater than or equal to two, or two poles that are simple. Okay, why is that? Because they sum to zero. If you just have one simple pole. This sum of the residues is not going to be zero. It's going to be anything but zero, right? So at the very least, at the very smallest order of these elliptic functions that you're going to have naturally is going to be two, okay? Two. Here's another thing we can learn from this. Remember I said that all this crap is elliptic too? Well, guess what else is elliptic? This bad boy right here. And we know... It's elliptic, so it's got to be zero around the parallelogram. But what is this? This is the argument principle. This is all just basic complex analysis stuff. You don't know any of this, don't worry about it. It's, you could look it up. It's real quick. It's uh, very intuitive. Whatever. This is the number of zeros. Actually, let's do this. Forget this. This is the number of zeros minus the number of poles. Look at that. So the number of zeros minus the number of poles 
has to be zero. What does that mean? That means the number of zeros is the number of poles. Wait a second. Okay, what did I just say? That means on this parallelogram, I could either have a constant, or I could have something with a double pole, right? Or I could have a couple of poles, or I could have something more complicated than that. And if I have a couple of poles, that means I also have to have a couple of zeros, right? Now think about this. If I subtract a constant from this function, I'm still going to have a couple of poles and a couple of zeros, because it has to be that way. If I've got a pole and I subtract a constant, it's still going to be a pole. I mean, what's infinity minus 3? It's still infinity. So that means that it, if I have a pole of order 2, or if I have two simple poles, it means it's got to hit every single value in the complex plane two times. And only two times. Otherwise, I could subtract a constant for whatever that value is, and I'd have more than two zeros. You see what I'm saying? Crazy stuff. I'll repeat that one more time. This function is hitting every single value in the complex plane exactly as many times. Okay? That's fucking freaky. That's freaky deaky. Now, here's another thing. All right. Actually, I think that might be a, another theorem in complex. Maybe it's not as freaky as I'm making it. Let's take this lattice. We call this capital omega. Okay? And we say capital omega is generated by little omega 1 and little omega 2. And all I'm doing here, I want to point out, this parallelogram right here, it's just right here. Right? There's omega 1, there's omega 2. But the thing is, like I said, you can tessellate this this parallelogram all the way across the complex plane. So that's all I've done. I've only done it in the in the whatever quadrant this is, the positive quadrant. But obviously it goes down this way, it goes that way too, you know. It's just easy to, you know, visualize in one quadrant. This whole lattice is is determined by these two points, omega 1 and omega 2. And what is this lattice? This lattice is well, it's it's all integer linear combinations of omega-1 and omega-2. All of them. Okay? So, you know, I mean, I just picked two integers. Uh, two and two. There it is right there. Two omega-1 plus two omega-2. Boom. Right? The whole thing. Now, here's what's trippy, and this is where a lot of the structure of this comes from. I'm going to prove this when I go over the exercises uh, in a different video that's going to be a lot more boring. If you think this is boring, just wait. But I, I find this fascinating. I hope you don't think this is boring. This is some of the sexiest stuff. If math could be sexy, this is as sexy as it gets. Now, this, if I have a lattice generated by omega-1 and omega-2, and I say, well, it's equal to another lattice generated by two different periods, omega-1 prime and omega-2 prime, this is the same as saying there exists A, B, C, and D, integers, okay, such that AD minus BC equals plus or minus 1, what is that, it's determinant, anyone, huh, huh, and omega 1, omega 2, prime, equal AB, CD, omega 1, omega 2. Okay, so what did I just say? If I can find a matrix that has determinant plus or minus 1, and we might as well relegate to positive 1, because I can always switch it around so that it's positive 1 if, if the determinant was negative 1. But let's just say that it's plus or minus 1, because either one works. If I can find a matrix with integer entries such that the determinant is plus or minus 1, and I change these two periods into these two periods, the lattices created are going to be equivalent. Now, this may not seem surprising, but what you, what you need to realize is happening here. What's happening is, these transformations are not changing volume, right? The determinant is 1, 
It's like a big freaking kaleidoscope. A big freaking kaleidoscope. That's the best way you can describe it. And it, let's let's do an example real fast. Let's try to think of what are some matrices that have determinant. We'll just stick with plus one. Well, I will note these are members of a very special group called SL2Z. Sometimes you see it written like this. SL2Z. It's a Lie algebra. Uh, maybe it's not actually. I don't know. Uh, this is now. I think it is a Lie group. This is a special, well, actually, with, I'm going to shut the hell up and just keep going. This is a very special group. We'll leave it at that, okay? And you think it about this. If you know anything about number theory, what's the first thing you might think when you see something, an integer times another integer, plus or minus an integer times another integer equals one? You should be thinking Euclidean algorithm. More specifically, you should be thinking co-prime, okay? Here's the, the most obvious example. Since this is a group, right? The most obvious example is the identity element. What's that going to do to this lattice? Not a thing. Okay, so let's find something more interesting. Again, I said co-prime, right? So A and B and A and C have to be co-prime, as well as D and B and D and C. Okay, well, A and B have to be co-prime, so let's pick two co-prime integers, two and three. There you go. That's pretty easy, right? Actually, we could. let's do another one just for fun. Okay, 2 and 3. Now what do I have to do to make this a determinant 1? Well, 2 times 2, uh, 3 times 1, bada bing, bada boom. That's determinant 1. There's another example. Let's do 1 and 2. Okay, uh, 1 and 1, 2 and 0. That works just fine. Okay, it works just fine. Um, so this is not going to change it. No change. Right, because I'm just going to use this, I'm going to put this up against it, it's going to spit out the same thing. But if I multiply omega 1 and omega 2 by this, what do I get? I get 2 omega 1 plus 3 omega 2, and I get omega 1 plus 2 omega 2. Let's make this one a little more complicated, but also simple. Sorry about that. I had to answer something. So let's let's think of a better way to do this. Another one that we could use. Let's use two here. But let's think of something a little bit more. Let's do three and then one. One times three minus two times one. That's going to give us... Uh, that's going to give us one. So let's try this. What does this do? Okay, so uh, one W1 and one omega one. Ooh. It's so easy to call those things W's because, let's face it, they look just like W's. Who are we trying to kid? This is in ancient Greece. Okay, so here we've got this um, omega 1 plus 2 omega 2 and omega 1 plus 3 omega 2. Okay, now, my claim from earlier is that if I take these two periods, that's saying this is a period and this is a period, and I replace these parallelograms with a parallelogram that looks like this, I'm going to get every single point back. It's not terribly surprising, but it's a little bit surprising. It's kind of cool. I think I'm going to do it with this one here. I think this is going to look a little bit easier. So let's, let's go ahead and see. Okay, so omega 1 in this case is going to be 1 omega 1. This is omega 1 prime and omega 2 prime. So this here is omega 1 prime, is 1 omega 1 plus 2 omega 2. So 1 omega 1 plus 2 omega 2. So right here, it looks like. All right, let's, don't make an idiot out of yourself. There you go, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Boom. So this right here, this is going to be my omega 1 prime. And then we got omega 2 prime is going to be omega 1 plus 3 omega 2. So that's right here. All right? Right there. So here's my omega 1 prime. Here's my omega 2 prime. Right? Um, what's this one going to look like? And it, again, 
I would make this parallelogram. It, it's going to be super freaking long. But what I'm trying to say is this parallelogram is a complete shift of everything you see here. It's not losing any volume, right? They're just stretching these parallelograms out like a big kaleidoscope. Okay, so for instance, the next line is going to look like this. It's going to look like this, and it's going to go way the hell up here. And then this one's going to go way the hell up here. And you're going to have this thing. No, I don't want to shift the dadgum idiot. You get my point. There's going to be infinitely many parallelograms again, except they're not going to look the same, but they're still going to hit all the same points. Right? It's wild stuff. And there's infinitely many of these matrices. So that means that for every lattice, there's infinitely many different ways to write the lattice. This is key. Okay. And this group, we're going to be looking at very heavily later on. All right. I'm going to pause it for a second. Uh, and we'll figure this out here. Hang on a second. I'm going to pause this, clean this up, and then we're going to get into some real stiff. Okay. I actually took the opportunity to rewrite these more neatly, and they look just as crappy as they did before. But you don't care. All right. So, what does one of these functions actually look like? Okay? What does one of these functions actually look like? Well, there's two ways to go about this. There's the Weierstrass way and the Jacobi way. You remember I said that at the, the simplest one, simplest, is going to have a pole of order 2. Or, let's say the simplest non-constant elliptic function is going to have a pole of order 2 or two simple poles. Weierstrass went this way. Jacobi went this way. This is the easier of the two ways, but we will get into this a little bit later on. So here's what we do. We start with the dumbest function we could find. We're not requiring anything else of this, mind you. Okay, we're just going to put a pole of order 2 at every omega where omega is in capital omega, the lattice. Okay? This is our function, bada bing, bada boom. What's the problem with this? Doesn't converge. Sorry, okay? What we do then, let's say this is f. What we do is we integrate it, believe it or not. We integrate this function. There's a theorem that I'm not going to go over the proof of. It's in Apostle. I would highly recommend getting this book, by the way. It's a great proof. It's beautiful. I really do sound like Trump, the Trump of math. It's a beautiful proof. What you find is that if you're using alpha, okay, this works if alpha is greater than or equal to 3. Okay? Why is that? Because again, you're looking at a lattice of points. Remember, you're, you're counting over a lattice of points. And we know that, we know that zeta 2 is a thing, right? But zeta of 1, <laughs> that's not a thing. That's a harmonic series, right? You can't be doing none of that nonsense. So we got to stick with something that is at least alpha 3 here, okay? What we're going to do then is we're going to take that series I just had with 2, and we're going to integrate it, okay? We're going to integrate this. We're going to integrate this. Brr, idiot. There we go. We're going we're gonna to take away, first of all, the 1 at 0, okay? And we're going to add this over here. And then we're going to integrate this bad boy from 0 to z. And we're going to make it look a little bit sexier, okay? And what we're going to get is the Weierstrass p function. I don't know what the hell this character is. I think it's p, but I don't know, okay? So don't hate me. This is 1 over z squared plus the infinite sum of all the omegas in the big omega except for 0 of 1 over z minus omega squared minus 1 over omega squared. Is this periodic? Yes, it is. 
Yes, it is. Because we're counting over every single omega, if I plug in z plus omega, all I'm doing is shifting the lattice down by something. Okay? If I pick any period, all I'm doing is shifting z down, and I'm still hitting every omega in big omega. It's the same thing. This thing is doubly periodic. Another thing worth noting is that this is even. Is an even function. That's kind of interesting. That gives us a little bit more structure to what we had before. And we're going to use this in actually proving in the exercises that any even elliptic function can be written in terms of this Weierstrass uh, function.